Greetings. I'm Jessica Pearson. I direct the Center for Policy Research in Denver, and I co-direct the Fatherhood Research and Practice Network. Um, I'm going to take a moment before we uh, jump launch the webinar to in tell you a little bit about uh, FRPN, uh, today's topic, and introduce our panel. So first you have a visual of uh, my colleagues on FRPN, uh, my co-director is Jay Fagan of Temple University. Rebecca Kaufman of Temple is the Senior Research Coordinator. And uh, my colleague Nancy Thonis at Center for Policy Research is uh, also a, a consultant on the FRPN. Um, the FRPN is a five-year uh, cooperative agreement between Temple and uh, Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. We are in the middle of year four. Our goal is to build uh, quality evaluation research in fatherhood field and communicate uh, our research to practitioners and researchers. We want to uh, improve practice by informing it with research and we want to build evaluation capacity in both the research and practitioner community. So um, with, we've been uh, pretty active in all three areas of um, uh, FRPN activity with respect to promoting rigorous research. We've had three funding cycles, and we have uh, made 13 different awards, totaling $850,000 uh, to generate uh, rigorous research in the fatherhood field. Uh, we have also developed new measures, uh, new outcome measures for non-resident fathers, and those are available on our website. Um, with, re with respect to building evaluation capacity, we host one-day certificate programs at various fatherhood practitioner conferences. We uh, disseminate research uh, at uh, research conferences around the country. Uh, we host these websites, uh, webinars uh, quarterly, and uh, publish extensively on our work. Um, and with respect to information dissemination, we urge you to visit uh, our website, www.frpn.org, where you will find resources, our outcome measures, and other resources. So why a webinar or inside uh, the black box? I think in the fatherhood field, we focus on, as in so many other fields, we focus on recruitment and retention of participants into various program services, and then we focus on service outcomes and how to measure those, how to track those, whether they're significant, whether um, they, how they translate into practice. We pay less attention to the intervention itself and what, in this case, fathers are actually experiencing. Uh, how much they are experiencing, their engagement in what they experience, and how consistently it is being delivered. So um, we, I think that argues for today's webinar in which we will focus on how to track both the in-house services that fathers get and the services to which they are referred so that we have a true understanding of what dosage and service delivery actually constitutes, how to ass consider assessing client buy-in and their attitude towards services. Are they just going through the motions? Are they really engaged? And finally, how consistent service delivery is over time, over different practitioners and different iterations. Um, those are our goals for today. We're really skipping through a lot of territory, so uh, this will be a taste 
And I should say, all these slides will, and the recording of this webinar will be posted on our website, so if we, uh, you, you can access it uh, at your leisure. Um, our presenters. Uh, first up is my colleague, Lene Davis, Senior Research Associate at CPR. She'll be talking about measuring service delivery. Next, Diane Yachmanoff, who is uh, the Director of Trauma-Informed Oregon at Portland State University at Center for Excellence at Portland State University dealing with trauma-informed care. And we'll wind up with Cleopatra Howard Caldwell, who is Professor and Chair and Director of the Center for Research on Ethnicity, Culture, and Health at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Um, we are going, uh, the presenters will pass the baton from one to the other uh, to maximize the amount of time we'll have left for questions at the end. So I will, uh, uh, we'll see you on the other side and we're going to start off now with Lene. Thank you, Jessica. My presentation today is going to focus on tracking and measuring service delivery. Uh, first, we're going to answer the question of why, why your program should track uh, and measure service delivery. We'll look at some of the major methods for tracking and measuring service delivery. We'll discuss the dosage and why it's important to measure service dosage. And we'll also look at what can actually be tracked and how to accurately report on service delivery. So first off, why track service delivery? We often hear about services provided as being a black box, meaning it's difficult to, to describe what's in that box. Uh, certainly, you're able to describe as an organization what you provide, but it's much more difficult to measure and accurately quantify those specific services. It's important to be able to define the services uh, your organization or agency provides to accurately describe programming to important audiences, such as your funders. Common questions you should be able to answer when you measure service delivery include, are your services mandatory or voluntary? With what frequency are your services delivered? Do your participants use your services daily or weekly? Is it on an as-needed basis? What are the most common services accessed by your clients? Is there a combination of services that are most frequently utilized by your clients? And finally, an important but often overlooked measure is client program status. Program status of clients is constantly changing. It can be important to quantify not only program completers, those who go through your entire intervention, but also the attrition and mobility of those clients through your program. That will help you with managing your resources, your staffing levels, and ultimately reporting on your program uh, success towards your goals. To track your program status, you can define what is important to your organization. Do you define and track program completion? Do you track dropouts? Choosing a point in time, for example, quarterly or at six or 12 months post-enrollment, and recording that client status at key points in time will provide you with a measure of program success. What are some of the major tracking options? Um, there's three kind of key ways to track program service delivery. Um, there's the uh, good old-fashioned pen and paper or hard copy paper forms. There's a slightly more high-tech Excel spreadsheets, which I know are very commonly used by community service providers. And finally, there's online management information systems, commonly referred to as an MIS. And each, each method has its sets of pros and cons. Here's an example of a hard copy paper form. The benefits of using paper, pen and paper are that it's very inexpensive, it's easily adapted and easily revised. You're able to adjust what you collect if, for example, you determine you forgot to collect a key piece of information. But some of the cons include uh, that it's, you know, there can be duplicates um, from data entry. You have to keep track um, of the papers themselves. If you have multiple staff members across multiple sites collecting paper forms, they're hard to track and ensure that they get entered correctly. Excel spreadsheets, as I mentioned, are a very common method of tracking data. They're very good because they can be simple or complex as you want them to be. You can add multiple sheets. You can merge on client identifiers. 
they're easily adjusted, and they're uh, easily analyzed. But some of the cons that are that they're um, filling them out can be very difficult. The data entry can get very confusing if there's too many ro rows and too many columns to track, and it doesn't lend itself to easy reporting and ongoing monitoring. And finally, a management information system. It can be a great tool. It's customizable. It can double as a case management tool for staff, uh, but it can be very costly. And oftentimes, those that are off the shelf tend to be more affordable, but they lack the level of detail uh, your organization may need. And the ability to make changes to report on accurate program services is sometimes costly and cumbersome. In this example, the program provides case management services. It can be difficult to define what case management looks like, as Jessica said in the introduction. And this is an example of an MIS that is designed to provide details on the intensity of staff time and providing direct services to clients. From this MIS screen, we're able to determine the frequency of contact with clients, the type of contact with the client, whether it was in person, over the phone, a text or video call, and that's through the drop-down menu. There's an average length of time spent with the clients that you would be able to report on, and if there's anyone else participating in the, in the client contact. You're able to analyze this data to provide a very robust uh, description of direct services at this organization. Taking the previous slide uh, one step further and tying it to cervix content in a closed or fixed choice manner, includes a comprehensive list of services provided by the organization. This will help you better describe the types of services your clients most seek, how much time your staff is devoting to providing those services, and better define the most utilized and effective services provided by the organization. This example on your screen I know is small and, and difficult to read, but it just shows a great checklist of all the services that an organization provides or an intervention provides or an agency provides by a uh, main content heading and then some very great detail as to what um, is going into that service delivery. It's important to track services and referrals separately, distinguishing between services provided by your organization and referrals made to outside organizations. If you have a staff member routinely refer a client for legal services, for example, but you don't directly provide any legal services yourself, it's important to separate the two. Referrals are different than services delivered and should be tracked and reported separately. In this example in front of us here, from the MIS, it shows that there's a separate area for referrals uh, to be tracked um, distinct from where you're tracking services. An MIS is also a very useful way to track client attendance in a series of classes or workshops. You can create groups and assign clients to a group, allowing you to create a class roster, record attendance, and more importantly, follow up with those who did not attend. It can assist you with tracking how many sessions each client attends if you have multiple sessions and cohorts running concurrently. This can also allow you to reassign clients who do not appear to the next session or move them to a different group if scheduling conflicts arise. This will also help in tracking client program status and reporting on outcomes. If you define program completion as completing four or more classes, for example, then you can track in your MIS which clients attended four or more classes and which did not. Regardless of the tools being used, you'll need to decide what is actually being tracked. Is it services or referrals? When analyzing and reporting on service data collected, it's important to ensure these distinct categories. If the program being studied provides the services in-house, it's fairly easy to measure client participation. Uh, if the program makes referrals to other agencies, it may be too difficult to follow up on which clients pursued the referral and how many times the client was served by the referral agency. Referrals are much more difficult to track, primarily because the service is not provided in-house. And dosage. What is actually being tracked? Dosage can matter. By providing more detail in tracking the services provided by the organization, you're able to accurately analyze and describe what's inside the black box. 
Defining the dosage of services provided can help determine the most common service or menu of services accessed by clients and the level of staffing needed to achieve your outcomes. For example, by reporting on a percent of all participants who attend a class is very different than being able to say 80% of your clients attend five or more classes. This can have serious implications for your organization and the outcomes that you hope to achieve. You may be able to say that 100% of your clients meet with a case manager, but you should be able to say that 50% of them met with a case manager more than three times, and then you can look at outcomes. Those who met with a case manager greater than three times, do they achieve better outcomes than those who only had one meeting? This example shows a very different level of engagement by the client and the staff person. Or through tracking attendance, you're able to state that 75% of clients attend a fatherhood class with 50% attending four or more. You can then look at outcomes for those who are more engaged in programming to see if they show a greater increase in parent-child contact, for example. Dosage matters, and tracking service dosage will allow you to more accurately describe service delivery as it relates to key outcomes. No matter what, you will need to first decide what you are going to collect, why you are collecting it, and how you will use it. Creating a logic model will help your organization define what outcomes you want to achieve and outlining the activities and inputs that will lead to those outcomes. Decide if you need to collect periodic input, same report multiple times or different reports over time. Make sure data gets entered. The best system is useless without timely correct data entry. I always say to staff that are collecting data, if it's not recorded, it didn't happen. And finally, ensure data entry is consistent across staff, across programs, and over time. We all know staff turnover can be an issue, and keeping staff trained and up to date and training new staff as they come on board will help ensure buy-in and accurate results are reported for your organization. I complete my presentation, and I'll be available for questions and answers following the other two panelists. And Diane, I will turn it over to you. Whoops, I was on mute. Sorry. Hi, everyone. This is Diane Yachmanov calling in from Portland, Oregon. And um, I'm going to pick up where Lene left off, recognizing that service delivery and participation are indeed important measures of program activity and sometimes program success. But I want to move on to talk a little bit about an approach to measuring client engagement from the client's perspective. And in particular, we're going to talk about a research tool called the Client Engagement in Child Protective Services Instrument. That's what those letters CECPS on your screen mean. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about how the instrument came to be and how it was developed. And then for those of you that might be uh, interested in pursuing it a little bit, I want to throw out some guidelines and cautions about using it and also talk about um, adaptations that you want to make, might want to make to fit your context and setting and population. And then I also want to spend a little, t little time talking about a um, measure that we developed to capture the workers' perceptions of client engagement along the same dimensions that we asked of clients. So by way of background, this is going back to the late 90s. We were doing a ton of research in child welfare here in Oregon. And in particular, I was involved in a great big um, uh, evaluation of something called strengths needs based practice. And along with a, lo a lot of other promising approaches back in the day, it was based on very strongly held social work principles and strong philosophy. And we had a terrible time showing anything but mixed outcomes from our evaluation studies. And in fact, the evaluation of outcomes wasn't helping us very much. So we were also interested in looking inside the black box. And in fact, we interviewed literally hundreds of child welfare families, their caseworkers, and in many cases, community partners that were providing them services. And that study, I was not exactly a brand new researcher, but I was new-ish. And that study had a pr profound effect on my career because uh, there were a lot of observations to make about child welfare in those days and still today. But one of the most striking observations that I had was that the barriers that a family 
faced were not necessarily the driving factor in what actually happened. I could interview a family with such serious and multiple challenges that I couldn't imagine how they were going to get into next week, never mind get their kids back, and six months later go back and find that that family was doing extremely well. I can interview another family that looked like things weren't so bad and there weren't so many challenges, and that case could go south. Um, and never come back. And the observation, there were a lot of things to think about, but the observation that really struck me is, wow, there really are huge differences in the degree to which we are successfully engaging these families in services that are intended to help them. And so I don't have time to walk you through my logic model. My slide pack is too long already. But I want to point to the um, bold and um, the boldest um, rectangle right in the center where it says client is on board. And this phrase came to me from a worker in one of the endless meetings we had in the field during that study. And he stood up in a room full of caseworkers and a bunch of us researchers, and he said, if you don't have the client on board, you got nothing. By team that services are only effective to the extent that the client is actually engaged in them. And I thought, wow, that's what I think too. And that actually shaped you know, a research agenda for me. So what I wanted to know is how is it that our service system contributes to engagement, achieves it, sustains it, fosters it, maintains it. I knew that a lot of it came from the client, but I was interested in what the role of the service system is in achieving engagement. And so in order to study it, I had to go find the measure of it, which I was um, sure was out there. It seemed like a no-brainer to me. But of course I was wrong. And what I found were measures of participation. Did the client attend services? And actually none as sophisticated as what Lene is talking about. But did the client attend services? Did they stay in services? Um, and that did not seem sufficient to me. There were some observa observational measures around the level of active participation, but I saw nothing that captured the internal state of engagement that I was interested in, and nothing what matched, that matched what families were telling me about the difference between the folks who, were, who um, as they said, had their butt in the chair at the parenting programs versus those that were actually really trying to benefit from the services. So. And that um, told me that I need to come up with such a measure. And um, coming right out of that study, I had a very simple definition for client engagement as positive involvement in a helping process. I wanted to know what the dimensions of that were. I wanted to know if we could assess it. I went on a basic premise that only the client knows how the client feels, and so we would have to ask. And I want to emphasize that I was aiming for a research tool to evaluate the quality of services, not an assessment of how the client was progressing. And that's really important, and I want to carry that forward to today as well. My second um, agenda, which was really important to me, is I was hoping that by coming up with this measure and a conceptual framework for the internal state of engagement, I could make a contribution to practice. I wanted to sensitize workers and supervisors and others to what was going on with their clients in the hopes that we would improve practice that way. So I did what you do when you go to develop a measure. I did a lot of lit review, but um, mind you, I had m literally miles of transcripts and observation from this big study that we were doing. And out of those, a conceptual framework I made, uh, uh, emerged with five initial domains, and I will just name them and I'll give some examples in a minute. But the first one was receptivity. If a client is engaged, they're at least a little bit open to receiving help hope the client believes the services may be of some benefit. Investment, the client is putting something of himself or herself into the services. Working relationship, the client has some kind of mutuality with the worker. And the last one um, is called mistrust, which was so prevalent in the data I could not leave it out. It is the deeply embedded belief on the part of many clients in the child work welfare system that the agency is out to get them. This can come from personal experience. It can come from family experience. It can come from community experience and community stories. It can sound highly paranoid. It is not always unfounded. And I wanted this measure to reflect 
what I'd actually heard from clients in their own voices. So I kept that one in as well. So I sat at the beach with all those transcripts, and I wrote um, items for this measure, hundreds of them actually, directly from what clients had said. And then I went through a bunch of research processes to weed down, sort out, get consensus, and do all the things that you do when you're developing a measure. And I got it down to 37 items which formed the study that is, uh, was published in about 2005, I think. And we took that out and recruited 300 child welfare clients that we did interviews with using the instrument as well as a lot of other um, instruments to look at validity and reliability issues. And the final results were very strong. It allowed us for parsimony's sake to get it down to 19 questions, which is much easier to swallow, and to collapse two of those domains into um, the core domain of engagement, buy-in. So we collapsed that hope and investment into buy-in. And so that is the study that um, there's a reference to at the end of this presentation that you can take a look at if you want. So in each of those four domains, there are three or four different items, and I'm just giving you some examples here to give you a flavor of it. Um, receptivity, for example. I realize I need some help to make sure my children get what they need. There definitely were some problems in our family. Buy-in, working with CPS, that's Child Protective Services, has given me more hope about how things will go in the future. I really want to make use of the services CPS is providing me. Relationship, uh, I think my caseworker and I respect each other. My worker and I agree about what's best for my child. Mistrust, anything I say, they're going to turn it around and make me look bad. Now in each of the domains, actually, there are both positively and negatively worded items because, again, I really wanted to reflect the things that people had said to me and to our other interviews in that study. So if you take a look at the instrument, which will be posted on the um, Research Practice Network, I think, and you certainly can get it from me if it's not posted there, if you decide you're interested in, in maybe pursuing or thinking about using it or using some of the ideas, I want to throw out a couple of cautions and guidelines. First of all, we were going into this as researchers. We were not CPS workers nor program people, and so we got very good data. You, if you're a program person or, God forbid, working for CPS, and you're asking a client to self-disclose how they really feel about services, I think you really have to think about whether that's ethical, whether it is safe for the client to do that, and whether you'll get good data. So this is an instrument intended to evaluate the quality of services. It's intended to be done with anonymity or at least confidentiality for the client in terms of their responses. So that's an important thing to think about if you're out there in a program thinking about assessing client engagement. How are you going to do it in a safe and ethical way where you'll get good data? The second thing to know is that 19-item measure requires a face-to-face -face interview. It cannot be done as a paper-pencil survey, and that's because of the nature of the questions and some of the double negatives and some of the language of the folks that were in that study. Um, it does not work very well as a paper-pencil because so many folks want to use it that way and have asked um, for assistance over the years. Um, we created a short form. It is 14 items. It holds up very well psychometrically with respect to the 19-item measure, and it eliminates the problems for paper pencil. So if you're considering using it, I urge you to use the short form, which I'm happy to send to people or also post on the website. A reminder again, um, the instruments are intended to use for group results, not making decisions about individuals. For those that are interested, there is a scoring guide available with some additional information and some help with items that need to be reverse scored and using the summary score versus subscale and so forth, and I'm happy to send that along. The most important thing I want to say is um, you noticed that it was developed for Child Protective Services and non-voluntary clients. You're all working out there in very different settings and programs, I'm guessing. And moreover, in the child welfare system, most of the time the identified client is the mother. So something like 85% of the sample in my study were women. Um, so as you read the items, when you look at the instruments, 
I believe you're all serving fathers, um, look at the items from that perspective. You're the expert on whether those items will work for your population, not me. And moreover, this is Portland, Oregon, and so although I oversampled to get a significant number of African Americans and Latina families, it's still Portland, Oregon, and those numbers are pretty small. So again, as you look at the instrument, think about how you might modify, if you like the core ideas, how you might modify it for your population, your program, your community. You can do your own reliability assessment for internal consistency. It's very simple and straightforward to do. If you don't have that skill set, your family or your fatherhood research practice network folks can help you. Bottom line, use your judgment. Unless you're going for NIH funding, I highly recommend you adapt it for your own use. And both of those forms are available. So I also want to talk just briefly about um, a worker measure. As I said to begin with, I was actually really interested in sensitizing workers to these dimensions of client engagement. And I wanted them to not only think about the domains, but also, you know, what might we do to increase buy-in or build a better working relationship or reduce that mistrust. So I developed a 13-item worker view measure that lines up with the client engagement domains. And I did a study using an overlap sample using client report, self-report measures and worker report measures on a variety of, of um, instruments in that study. And I wanted to look at agreement. And what I found was um, it wasn't terrible that in about 60% of the cases, the worker and clients agreed absolutely. If the worker rated the client really high in engagement, so did the client. If the worker rated in the middle range, so did the client, and likewise at the bottom. In about 20% of the cases, there were some differences, and in, in a little less than one in five, they were way off. So the differences came largely because, not surprisingly, if the worker rated the client high on compliance, they were more likely to rate them high on engagement to a greater extent than the clients told us they were actually positively engaged. So um, I wanted to give you just a set of a few sample items from this measure in case some of you are interested in potentially taking a look at it. So there are things like this client wants the same things for themselves and the family as the agency wants. This client is ready to make some changes in behavior or lifestyle to safeguard their children. I think this client believes we can help them. In my opinion, this client feels genuine ownership over the case plans and goals. I think the client feels hopeful about the outcomes of our involvement. So those are a, a sample of some of the items on that measure. What I like about it and what some of you might like about it is that it's a lot easier and less costly to use and doesn't have the ethical issues around self-disclosure that the client self-report measure does. I also think it's really useful as a thinking tool, getting workers or program folks to think about the individual items and the constructs is not a bad idea. I've seen it used successfully also in staffing as a kind of a consensus model. And now we're kind of taking off our research hat and putting on our practice hat um, where I think it also can be um, re really helpful as a sit down with the client. Like, wow, I've been thinking about how you're feeling about working with us and here's some of the ways that I was thinking about it. How does this line up with how you're feeling and what might we do to make this a better experience for you and so on. So now I've totally taken off my research hat because in reality um, when you get down to that level you may or may not be capturing the actual internal experience of the client and so it may not be as useful as a research tool. Again, depending on the level of trust in the particular circumstances. So that takes us right back to the beginning um, where it, it's on you to think about what is it in your system, in your program, in your efforts that you are doing to enhance, to strengthen engagement of the folks that you're working with and how do you know you've got it when you've got it? How do you look for it and how do you foster it? And is it helping you get through to the outcomes that you're trying to achieve? 
So I will actually stop there. I've got these references on here so you'll have a record of them. And anyone can feel free to contact me for more information and questions. And I'll be around at the end of this webinar as well. So I will pass on. Thank you, Diane. Good afternoon. I'm Cleo Caldwell, and I'm calling in from Ann Arbor, Michigan at the University of Michigan. And it is my pleasure to be a part of this panel to talk about an issue that I think about constantly because we're actively involved in implementing a fatherhood program. So my topic for this afternoon is measuring fidelity in fatherhood programs. Now, there has been a an explosion in interest in fatherhood programming ever since the Responsible Fatherhood Act um, occurred about 20 years ago. And with that, many people are looking for evidence-based programs, and it can be very challenging to t in terms of trying to find evidence-based programs. But one of the things that's really important to understand is even with evidence-based programs, it does not guarantee that you'll get the outcomes that you're looking for. So success is not guaranteed by simply identifying an evidence-based program and implementing that. And that's because the quality of implementation fidelity matters. That's critical um, for you to achieve the success that you're interested in achieving. So program implementation impacts participant outcomes. So therefore, we have to have assessments of program effectiveness that also consider the quality of implementation. So if we ask ourselves, what is program fidelity? Well, program fidelity really is the extent to which programs are delivered in the way intended by program developers. Now, program developers have an advantage because they are going to be developing programs and implementing them under the best of circumstances. But that's not always the case when we then move programs into the general community for implementation, for example. So therefore, we have to pay attention to fidelity. And the most common ways of measuring fidelity are paying attention to adherence, exposure, quality of program delivery, participant responsiveness, and program differentiation. So let's just take each of those one by one. So program adherence, that's the same thing as the integrity of the program. Basically, was the program implemented as planned? And that's something that can be measured, and that's something that you can standardize the implementation across through training, and that's something that you want to understand so that you can know how the program impacted the outcomes you're interested in. Exposure. Exposure is the same as dose effects, and we've already heard um, some discussions in terms of measuring dose effects, but this is the amount of content that was actually received. When we say we're doing a 15-session program, and each session is two hours each, we have an expectation that participants will actually be exposed to that amount of content in the program in order to achieve the outcomes we're looking for. But that's not always the case. Quality of program delivery. So facilitative characteristics is one area that's important to understand. It may be that you have particularly good facilitators who happen to interact extremely well with participants, and that outcome might be different than facilitators who may have low affect and don't interact quite as well. So there are certain types of characteristics that we track on facilitators in terms of knowing something about their backgrounds, their ethnicity, even age might make a difference depending on the type of program you're implementing. But quality of program delivery has many different facets that become important to understand. Participant responsiveness. This is basically how engaged are the participants in the program. And one of the things that you want is to have high levels of engagement so that you can have some sense of what participants are maintaining from um, the activities that are a part of your program. And then program differentiation. This looks at actually different components of the program. There may be multiple things that you're doing within the context of the program. And how do you know which one of those components of the program may be the one that's having the effect on particular outcomes of interest? One thing we do know in looking at the literature is, in general, documentation of fidelity 
tends to be deficient in behavioral interventions and programs. We don't pay enough attention to this concept. So what I thought I'd like to do with the time that I have today is just share some experiences that we've had implementing a program called the Fathers and Sons Program that requires us to pay attention to this issue of fidelity in order to have a sense of how well the program is working. In general, the overall aim of the study was to improve relationships between non-resident African-American fathers and their sons in order to prevent or reduce substance use, violent behavior, and early sexual initiation among the sons by improving the father's parenting behavior. So parenting is at the heart of this intervention. We also wanted to enhance positive health behaviors among fathers and sons, and this looked at basic physical activity and uh, request for services, needed services at the end of the intervention. The basic approach is that we use the quasi-experimental design, pre-test, post-test, four-month follow-up, and at the heart of this intervention is this intergenerational focus. We had both the fathers and the sons in the intervention together. This program is theoretically guided. It focused on culture, it focused on gender, and development uh, as important considerations in the development of the program itself. It's a 15-session intervention that's implemented over about a two-month period, and it's implemented in small groups, anywhere from six to ten families at a time. The sample itself is non-resident African-American fathers with eight to 12-year-old sons, and in this particular study, 287 families participated. What I'm going to focus on today is the fidelity sample, and in the fidelity sample, these are the participants who were in the intervention arm of the study. And there were 158 father-son families uh, that participated. Average age, about 37. 25% uh, never lived with their son. 82% were never married to the son's mother. And about 52% were employed. And about 70% had a child support agreement. The child was about 10 years old in about the fifth grade with an average of about four siblings. Now, one of the reasons why it's so important to really track um, some of the fidelity issues related to program implementation is because we were implementing this in groups. In order to do that, one of the things we had to do was to train our facilitators and observers and they tended to be African-American males and females. We set it up so that the same facilitator and observers were paired in order to implement the assigned group, and we recruited from community members, from local schools, social service agencies, local community organizations. So they were community residents from the same community where our families were being recruited who were trained to be the facilitators and observers in the intervention itself. In order to standardize what would happen from group to group, we had a manualized curriculum, we had a facilitator's training manual, and we had very structured training. It was a total of about 24 hours of interactive training led by the PI and the project supervisor. And we re um, required additional intervention practice sessions. So even after taking the structured formal intervention, the facilitators practiced implementing the sessions, and we videotape them and then debrief around expectations for facilitation. This became an important part of this process of preparing, um, in, uh, preparing our facilitators to implement this 15-session intervention. The observers were also trained in taking notes because their job was to be the eyes and ears of the project to understand what the facilitator was doing, to understand what the participants were doing. And in both cases, we always had deep briefings. Reinforcement of training sometimes was necessary, especially if there were particular areas that a facilitator may have struggled with. Now I'm going to go through several of the components of fidelity that we were able to tap in. But first, I just want to mention some of the outcomes of this program that um, we had success with. We were able to enhance the parental monitoring behaviors of the fathers, communication about sex with the son, race socialization behaviors, which is critical when we are talking about African-American families, and parenting skill satisfaction. 
We also were able to increase sons' intentions to avoid violence and to engage in physical activity. But an important um, component that was successful in this intervention was that um, we observed reductions in sons' aggression but that was mediated by father's improvement in communication about risky behaviors. So enhancing the parenting behaviors of father had um, implications for son's outcome, which is what we were looking for. But now if we go back to program fidelity, to what extent was the fathers and sons program implemented as intended? And that's, again, at the heart of fidelity. So what we were able to um, measure in terms of the um, dimensions of fidelity was adherence, exposure or dose effect, quality of program delivery, and participant responsiveness. So I'll just quickly go through how we measured it. So in terms of the adherence assessment, we used structured observer rating forms. And these were forms that as the facilitator was implementing the intervention, the observer was keeping track of exactly what that facilitator was doing. So the facilitator's fidelity for each of the sessions was evaluated, and all expected curriculum activities included uh, were included as a part of this form. So if that person was supposed to do a particular activity, that activity was included on the form. The introduction sessions were included on the form. The closing sessions were also included on the form so that we had a good idea of everything that the facilitator was supposed to do, and the observer then did an assessment of whether or not he or she did it. The categories were either they missed or skipped a section of the intended activities as a part of the curriculum, they partially completed it, or they fully completed it. Now, our goal was to have every facilitator fully complete all of the activities that were a part of this 15-session curriculum. We can't guarantee that, but at least we were beginning to get a sense from the observer's note whether or not the facilitator was sticking to uh, the program plan. Participants' attendance and engagement were also recorded on this form, the start and end time of each activity, and the overall session timing was included on this form. That, again, gave us a lot of information about consistency across the different groups that were implemented as a part of this study. The group dynamics also were recorded on open-ended section of the form, and that allowed us to see something about the interaction between participants, but also interactions between the facilitator and the observer. So we are gathering a lot of uh, data to try to give us some information that will allow us to assess adherence. Facilitators also completed the debrief debriefing form after each session to record their assessment of how things went. And that debriefing was held weekly with the project supervisor. So in terms of results of adherence, overall program activities, 92% were fully completed. 4% were partially completed, and 4% were not completed at all. So again, not perfect, um, but 92% were fully completed as intended. Activities most often skipped or partially completed occurred during session nine, and this was a session that we had that involved um, using computers to communicate that required a change in location. And I'm not gonna talk about that now, but that session gave us a bit of a headache. 57% of the observer rating forms had all of the start and stop times recorded per um, session activities. So that's a lot of recording. And again, it wasn't 100%, but the idea is as we standardize the facilitator's behavior, we also have to work on standardizing the observer's uh, behavior. 84% of the sessions were completed in the order intended. So that's the other thing that's really important because sometimes uh, facilitators may begin where they feel most comfortable as opposed to beginning from the beginning of the intervention as intended. Now in terms of exposure, the structured observer rating form also allowed the observer to record participants' attendance at each of the 15 sessions, the family members signed in in the sign-in sheet, 
uh, provided for each session, and fathers and sons were expected to attend every session together with no makeup session provided. So that information became very important as we were trying to understand something about the dose effect. And dose was computed for father's attendance, for son's attendance, and for family level attendance uh, as well. So in terms of exposure result, uh, families averaged 12 out of 15 sessions. 78% of the participants completed more than two-thirds of the program, and 31% of the participants completed all 15 sessions. The second session had the highest average attendance at 93%, and the ninth, that friendly ninth session, had the lowest average um, attendance at 65%. Uh, the low program attendance had a lot to do with some logistical issues uh, in terms of moving the site of the intervention for that session. 92% of program activities were fully completed by program facilitators, which is another form of exposure. That is. Attendance of the participants is one thing, but if the facilitators are not completing the content of the intervention, that means the families are not getting the um, high or amount of the dose effect as you would intend. So you have to look at both sides of the uh, marker, the participants as well as the facilitators. Now, quality of program delivery. We use an assessment that looked at participant satisfaction and it is assessed after every session, and it's collected from both fathers and sons at the end of the session. Uh, my picture isn't very clear, but it's asking about whether or not they enjoyed the session, um, what information uh, was interesting, what information was helpful, and was this a good time, meaning the actual time of the intervention for the participants. And then there were open-ended questions at the bottom. What did you like most about the session? What did you like least about the session? The observer assessment form um, also had sections in it that allowed us to understand how the facilitator was doing in terms of interacting with the participants because they recorded the effectiveness of the delivery as well as any problems that may have occurred for each of the activities that the facilitator was intended to implement. Overall participant satisfaction, 92% of the fathers, 86% of sons were very satisfied with information presented across all of the activities, across all of the sessions for the program. So in general, uh, this tended, seems to be a program that resonated with the families who were involved. The observer's assessment, uh, we had some concerns about how accurate observers may have been and what it is that they were recording. So we conducted content analysis of succession transcripts and included uh, a congruence between the intended topics for the session based on the curriculum and the session discussion themes that were identified in the process of evaluation. So there was some level of agreement across those two sources of data. The average percent uh, activities completed were completed most often by those facilitators who led 10 or more sessions. For those who led less sessions, they were not as accurate as those who led um, more sessions. So participant responsiveness, um, the observer rating forms also allowed the facilitator to use a Likert scale to assess how engaged fathers were, and it ranged from very low engagement, low engagement, expected level of engagement, high engagement, and very high engagement. If the facilitator identified low engagement or very high engagement, then they were asked to comment on why, what supported those observations. The other thing that we found was completing of the homework assignments um, and completion previously designated homework assignments um, was an important part of this particular intervention. The outcome in terms of Engagement, 98% of fathers and 96% of sons were at the expected level or above for um, all of the sessions. Interestingly, for participants' homework um, assignments, the average was completing five out of nine homework assignments. So there was low participation in terms of completing homework assignments. 
But overall, the findings suggest a high degree of implementation fidelity, and, but we also know that the results may are likely influenced by both facilitator and observer training um, for ad adherence. Having facilitators and observers peered and present may provide reinforcement to the adherence of the structured intervention curriculum. In terms of quality of the program, uh, differences in cognitive abilities we knew mattered between fathers and sons, and that's something that we're going to pay more attention to in terms of um, some of the engagement questions. And then exposure, offering transportation services reduce the key barrier to participation. So when you're thinking about dose effect, you also want to think about how can you remove barriers to participation for participants. And then participant responsiveness using a group model, incorporating aspects of African-American culture, and providing participants' incentives may have contributed to the high levels of engagement um, that we observed. And so as I'm wrapping up here, I wanted to just mention a couple of limitations um, that we know existed as we are trying to do this fidelity assessment. Um, there was missing data across several sections, and that may have affected the results. We mentioned the completion rate of homework assignments, so that was not as high as we would like. We also mentioned that the most missed session was session nine, so that means in terms of dose effect, there was intended content that wasn't delivered. Additionally, aspects of dose effect and barriers to participation were not systematically documented. For example, one of the things that we understood was um, there could be conflict between um, the mother and the father, and that could have implications for uh, participation in the intervention. One of the things that we observed was tardiness. But tardiness um, was something that we did not document well enough to be able to um, take that into account when we were assessing dose effect. We were also working in a factory town, and sometimes there were third shift schedules that could have interfered with participation, and we did have situations where a major chronic illness um, occurred. So these are things that we want to do a, a better job of tracking and understanding the impact on um, fidelity. We also know the homework assignments must be assessed to increase completion rates and determine the contribution of that component of the program. That's actually taking us closer to that idea of program differentiation. There were multiple components to the program. Homework assignment was one of them. Homework assignment was one that we really did not have high fidelity on as we were um, collecting the information from um, the fathers and sons. And we also know that the external evaluator may have identified issues that the internal observers may have missed. So having that external evaluator can be um, an asset. In terms of where we are going, we actually are replicating this study now. And as we train our observers, because we were concerned about um, the effectiveness of the observer, and we got this idea from the Fatherhood Research and Practice Network was to check the inter-rater reliability on the observers during training. And we just had training last week, as a matter of fact, and we did do that. And I think that was a big asset because we could see some of the areas where they were likely to skip. And then our goal is to gain a better understanding of the relationship between the multiple forms of dosage effects and the intervention outcomes and measuring group cohesion becomes important, and making sure that the family level um, assessments are accurate. So with that, I will stop and move into our question and answer period. So I will turn it over to Jen at this point. Thank you. The floor is now open for questions. You can simply answer your, submit questions through the phone by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, we ask that while posing your question, you pick up your handset to provide favorable sound quality. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad at this time. Please hold while we poll for questions. Um, this is Jessica, and I'm going to start us off because I have so many questions. Lene, how can we use um, how can we use uh, the data from a service, reliable service information to achieve quality improvement? How have you used it with, in multi-site projects and you know, what sure. kind of benefits does it have? Sure. So 
typically we conduct a brief analysis, and it's not complex or detailed. It's typically very descriptive in nature and describes kind of monthly enrollment or quarterly enrollment, and then feed that back to program staff uh, to use in uh, you know, gauging are we on target with how many uh, fathers, for example, we hope to engage? Do we need to adjust our enrollment procedures or identification procedures? Um, so feeding back, uh, you know, data, uh, and and again, not complex analysis, but um, you know, data pulled off of your system uh, is a good way to ensure that you're on track um, and you know, following the program uh, as designed. Thank you. And, and Diane, um, you note that correctly we're going to be mostly dealing with uh, fathers in, uh, in these programs that are on the line, but what about um, doing this in a group setting because a lot of fatherhood programming is delivering, delivered in a classroom setting or a group. What aspects of client engagement uh, should be measured in this kind of a context? Well, I think um, folks have used the client engagement measure, particularly the short form, in a group setting. But I think the program, the providers, the program staff themselves really have to think about whether they're going to be able to get good data and at what point during the life, for example, of that group would they want to pose those questions. And also, are they working with a participant group that is going to be comfortable responding to a paper pencil survey? Because obviously you wouldn't be um, interviewing uh, clients in a group unless you were doing some kind of a focus group. So I think that's why I basically come back to all the folks out there are the experts in their own programs and thinking about what is appropriate, what's the appropriate question you're trying to answer and what's the appropriate setting. So it is possible to do it in a group setting. I think it's actually really important to look at engagement, but the particular items in the client engagement measure may or may not fit for the specific group programs that your, your folks are dealing with. Okay. And, and Cleo, um, I think, how do you sell fidelity assessments to facilitators who, does it, who may see this as kind of cramping their style? They are, um, you know, they're, they've, they've got individual strengths and they uh, kind of probably like to go off script. How do you, how do you deal with that? Now, that's an excellent question because that's one of the challenges you face when you're assessing facilitator characteristics. There are some people who are much more robust than others. There are other people who are much more reserved. The training that we provide is a structured training, and we actually have a component of that training where we videotape the facilitators implementing a partial session so that they can understand more about their characteristics and how it may impact the group. We stress the importance because we um, recruit uh, facilitators from the community. We actually take them through the importance of the evaluation process and what it is that we're trying to accomplish and why it's so important to stick to the script. We try to provide a script that is um, in common language so that it makes them comfortable, and we pay attention to the different facilitators across the different groups. So we understand something about the characteristics of those facilitators. But one of the things that they cannot do is to change any of the content of the intervention. Okay. Do we have some questions from the floor? Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad at this time. Shall I? Do, I, do we have them, someone, or should I keep going with my questions? It looks like we do have one question from Mark, okay. from Mark Tran. Please state your question. Okay. Um, Hello, Mark. You might be on mute. I'm so sorry. I am on mute. Excuse me. <laughs> okay. I apologize. Welcome, uh, Mark. <laughs> thank you. Dr. Caldwell, hi, this is Mark Trahan from Texas State University. Hi. 
Hi, I've got a question for you pertaining to quality of observations of the groups. We're involved in a project that's um, evaluating the impact of a father curriculum program in a incarceration uh, facility, and we are trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure out a way to measure for quality um, of the intervention without um, videotaping, without um, you know, it, it's going to be potentially hard to have an observer in every group, and um, it's going to be uh, we're looking more at taking a look at the, the kinds of different components of the program that are being utilized in the group, and then having facilitators give their own feedback related to the quality of the group. But it's very difficult in those kinds of confining circumstances. I'm, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about that. I think that, again, is an excellent question because those are some of the real-life challenges. When we develop programs, most of the time we have them under the most ideal circumstances that we can work with. But then when we try to adapt them in the general community or in another setting like you're talking about, the reality hits in terms of how well we can track that information, whether it's because of resources or whether it's because of some of the constraints in the setting um, that right. the program is being implemented in. So in your case, if you can't have observers present at all of the sessions, one of the things from the um, uh, program director's perspective is to be able to drop in unannounced, to be able oh. to observe mm -hmm. what's going on. Mm -hmm. And that's one way that the facilitator is put on notice that you want to try to stick to the script as much as possible because you never know when someone oh. from the research team or the program team is going to come in to right. do an assessment. So you don't have to do it at every session, but right. just often enough so that they understand how important it is for them to stay on script. The okay. other thing that you're already doing is having the facilitator uh, complete the a feedback form. Because right. one of the things is when you train them, if they understand the significance of the evaluation of the, the program and how important that is, especially when they're first starting out, oftentimes they're willing to admit when they're not either comfortable with the topic or they're not as prepared as they thought they would be when they walked into that room. Um, so getting that feedback from them is important because you want to debrief with them at least once a week so that you get a sense of how things are going. Okay. And you'll find okay. that over time, for those facilitators who stick with you, that they're going to increase, their learning curve is going to increase, and they're going to be even better as time goes on. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Scott Leach. Please say your question. Hi. Um, I was just wanted to ask a question. Um, the, the facility tool that you spoke about, are you going to make that available at the end of the conference? You're talking to me, Cleo? When you yes, about the fidelity. Because I'm working oh, on something I want to look at the fidelity, yes. Uh, yes, that's something that we can make available. Okay. That's Thank you. I, can, I'm very much interested in that. We oh, can wonderful. post that. If it's okay, Cleo, we can post it on FRPN. We'll be posting Diane's instruments as well. Okay. Right? Okay. Thank Any you. other Thank questions? Thank you for your interest. Diane, I have a, a question about the timing of, of um, the, your assessments. Uh, when, when, how, do you do it at the beginning and at the end? Do you do it after a person, a client, has had some time of exposure? I think it would be a dynamic thing. A lot of these, these reactions would change over time. So what's the, the sweet spot or the sweet time to assess? Right, great, great question, Jessica. Um, and I think you almost kind of answered it yourself. So when I first started out, um, of course I thought, oh, you know, you get a client in, in the front door and you get them engaged and then you're ready to go. And of course it wasn't like that at all. And the observation was that engagement rose and fell and sometimes changed dramatically with a different worker. And so we ended up feeling that the engagement measure was actually pertinent at any 
time during the life of a case or during the duration of program services with the exception that right at the very, very, very beginning, and of course I was very sensitive to the Child Protective Service, we didn't interview anybody until they'd been in the system at least a month and maybe six weeks because people are just too raw. It's not a good time for a research interview and there also isn't enough time for people to find out what it's going to feel like them to be working in that system. And I think that's probably true. You know, the programs in your fatherhood um, network are probably, you know, vary a lot in their length. So I think judgment in terms of folks are coming in the door and, for example, that, you know, that group um, situation you mentioned in the last question, mm -hmm. people sitting down and doing a group-based intervention, um, how long before people kind of have enough of a feeling for it to know whether it's, whether they're really open to the services, whether the, the program is making them feel hopeful, whether they're pretty invested in it, um, and whether they, the person that's delivering the service is somebody they can work with. So I think you kind of use your judgment. Now, um, in my mind, programs, it's a monitoring tool, not for the individual, but for how, we, our, how are we doing as an organization. So I don't think of it as a pre-post on the individual. I think of it as at what point do we want to look at whether we're successfully engaging people, and maybe we want to do that every six months or every nine months or whatever it might be, depending on the length of time that the program lasts. There's no time that's inappropriate except probably when people first walk in the front door. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, although uh, in some cases, you know, even voluntary programs, sometimes folks are coming who have been referred by a system that um, doesn't feel very voluntary and somebody's looking over their shoulder. And so in some cases, knowing how people feel about even being referred to the program is not a b bad place to start. Exactly. Exactly. If they're being uh, referred by friendly referral by the court or a child support agency, quote unquote, it doesn't, uh, may not feel as voluntary as. Well, and you know, in reality, it, you know, it's, it says it's voluntary, but if the alternative is that, oh gee, we might have to go to court or go back to court, mm -hmm. that's, right. you know, it doesn't matter if you call it voluntary or not. And right. so that's right. where the client engagement measure, you know, modified in certain ways can be appropriate for um, programs that aren't technically non-voluntary. Right. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, so we do have a question from Amy Bornhoff. Please say your question. No? Hello, Amy. Are you, you might be on mute. I'm sorry. Yes, I was on mute. I'm sorry. I was curious if the information was going to – the PowerPoint was also going to be posted on your yes. Um, website. Yes, okay. it will it be. It's really valuable information, but it was a lot to take in. I right, sure that right. No, it. everything will be posted. Uh, I think the, uh, web, the webinar may take a, a week to get – the video may, or the uh, tape may take a few days to get uh, finalized and up there, but we will put materials up very quickly. Um, another question? Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Um, I'm going to ask Lene a little, little bit about while we wait. Um, what about designing your own MIS? What, what, kinds, what are the considerations? I guess talk a little bit about some of the pain and suffering, the highs and lows of doing that um, it, for sure. programs that may be uh, thinking of launching into this. Sure. So the first uh, recommendation is don't just go out and say, let's build this and hire someone and start building it. <laughs> first, you want to make sure that you have really defined, perhaps through a logic model or um, other format, to define what it is your outcomes are, or what you hope to achieve in the program, and make sure that you've got your uh, data items uh, 
well-defined um, and tested. So you want to pilot them, whether it's through uh, pa pen and paper form, you can create kind of intake and enrollment forms or tracking forms, uh, pen and paper, or through Excel. But I would definitely take a period of time to test what it is that you want to collect before you go in and actually uh, invest in building a system, uh, because they are costly or can be very costly. Um, and so that's the first step. Make sure you're tracking, you, you um, are uh, tracking what it is you hope to be able to report on. Uh, then you know, I would ask around uh, with other organizations, not necessarily other fatherhood organizations, but community service providers, uh, nonprofits in the community, and even uh, looking at um, like Department of Labor, the um, workforce programs have a lot of case management tools that they use. And so collecting uh, information on what others are using that are similar to what you hope to collect with your program is always a good next step uh, before jumping in. And then uh, I would uh, do a survey of what is out there um, that may work for you as far as an MIS. You know, that can range from an, an access database off the shelf to, uh, you know, a, a customized, um, completely brand new system that's specific to your organization. Uh, so again, I would make sure that you know what you're going, you need to collect um, and test that before you jump into building something. Uh, another thing to consider in building a system is the reports that you want to generate from that system. So there's key things that your organization is going to want to report on or that you do report on, and you want to make that easy for you uh, to get that information out of your system without having to you know, download and merge files and analyze, do some complex analysis of the data that you're collecting. So you're going to want, um, with an MIS, there's typically reports that are built in. And so thinking through uh, with your team and your staff what it is you hope to get out of that system, be able to report on easily and routinely um, is a key consideration as well. Thank you. Great. Um, we have any, anybody in the queue? There appears to be no questions at this time. Um, well, then I was, I'm going to hit Lene again because what, what about when you're working, when you're rolling it out, when you're uh, using it, what, what do you find the biggest challenges that workers have and what, what is the biggest um, challenge that you face? Is it worker turnover? That's the key thing or? Yes. There's, Lots of challenges. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I knew you would have an answer for that. <laughs> so to begin with, it's good whether it's an uh, uh, online MIS system or your, you know, you have pen and paper or an Excel file. It's good to have some sort of worker training um, where you have pulled together all the key staff, uh, whether it's over a webinar or in person. In person is always ideal to kind of walk through uh, data collection procedures um, and uh, have some written procedure um, or manual that you have developed in order to define what it is you're collecting, how you're collecting it, how frequently you're collecting it. Um, and so everyone that's collecting that data is on the same page with uh, key points that you hope to um, collect on. For example, um, in a project that we're working on currently, you know, there's, uh, we're collecting service information and case management contacts. And so some staff have, we've discovered uh, that some staff are reporting on uh, contact uh, through service type as opposed to contact under their case management tool. So you want to make sure that in your training you're defining where it is exactly you want those staff to collect that information on your system or on your form, and then making sure it's consistent across all of those, um, across all of the data collectors or all the staff that's collecting that information. Okay. Um, Diane, I know that you sort of put it on everybody to think about their own programs and think about how client engagement might uh, look for them, but may I, can you speculate a little bit from your domains? Uh, wh wh 
as between receptivity and buy-in or relationship mistrust, what do you think is most salient for uh, fatherhood programs? And what? And are there others that that might you know feature more prominently? Any thoughts there? Well, um, you know, this is totally speculation because I'm really not familiar with all the programs that are out there, all the um, great programs that are probably on this call. So I would assume, um, well, I don't even want to say that. I was going to say I would assume that folks are coming into these programs on a voluntary basis and they do recognize that they could use some help. And so maybe that whole receptivity thing is something that you kind of know is there when people come in the door. In other cases, again, as we were talking about the voluntary versus non-voluntary, it may or may not truly be there. And how do you know that? I think buy-in is always kind of the core central dimension. Do people actually feel like they're getting something out of the services, that services are something they want the services or something that are going to be helpful. So if I were in one of those programs and wanting to think about maybe maybe I have a graduate student working with us and we can put that graduate student into an evaluator role and we're going to collect some data on how we're doing and we're, we're going to make it anonymous and confidential and we're going to um, actually start working with clients, I would start Personally, I would start with the domains, and I would look at the items, and I would start saying, well, this item fits our program, this item doesn't, this item might fit if we change it this way. Um, and so I would actually go through, and uh, you can you know, you do that in a group consensus process. You can do it with focus groups. With There's a lot of different ways to do that, but I would start with the core, um, the core domains, and buy-in being the most central one. You're probably in the programs that you're working with, chances are you probably don't have the element of mistrust um, that comes up so much in child welfare. But then again, I don't know that. I think your program people will know the answer, though. But what about something, I don't know, did this come up for you, tenacity or just stick to it with us or um, um, kind of the energy that people summon for a bunch of things? not only this program, but other aspects of their life. Is that... Is that right. A- so that's captured a little bit in the, you know, the concept of investment. I'm putting something of myself into this. And, uh-huh. But it's, okay. it's, perfectly, it's perfectly legit for your programs or anybody else to say, okay, these domains may capture it in some settings, but we want to look at some other dimensions of engagement. Absolutely. And this instrument was developed quite a long time ago. I would probably do it differently now myself. Mm-hmm. For, with all the work that we've done around trauma and the impact of trauma, I might think about the whole some of the concepts quite differently than we did then. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking off um, and doing something different. Um, there's no there's no one way to um, slice this. Right, right. Cleo, what do you look for when you try to hire an observer, or you? Uh, I mean, what are the uh, prerequisites for that kind of in the job description? So I, oh, that's a good question because we actually have the job description uh, for the observer. But observers are people who we really need to pay attention um, to what's happening in the group. So one of the key skills that they have to have are good listening skills. Mm. So because observers are really like in the background of the intervention, that they are not with the facilitator implementing, they're observing what's going on. So we need people who have good writing skills. So um, even if they don't have the best handwriting, like I don't, uh, they know that they have to come back and make sure that the information provided is legible so that we can follow it. We have observers now who are using uh, their computers uh, to type notes, and we have to go through security issues um, around that, but that's one way of getting around the illegible handwriting part of it. We need observers who are also personable, because we actually have in two of our sessions where the observers and the facilitators um, work separately with the fathers and the sons. So the observer's job is to work with the son while we're doing some other things, like we have sessions on substance abuse, and we don't want the sons in there with the fathers as we're talking about looking for signs of drug use. 
Mm. So the observer works with the faci- with the sons on mm-hmm. another activity. Mm-hmm. So they also have to have um, a chari- charismatic kind of personality mm. because both the facilitator and the observers um, are seen as, as staff. They're seen as a team. They're mm-hmm. seen as being there in order to make sure that everything that's necessary for the session is done. But the characteristics, that person needs to be observant, that person needs to be able to listen, that person needs to be able to uh, capture uh, the dynamics in the room. And we, as I said, we just recently had a training, and after observing the participants who came in to be a facilitator or an observer, uh, we were able to make determinations about who would be the best facilitators and who would be the best mm. observers. Mm. And people were quite pleased with their roles. So you recruited in one group and then you sorted them out after. Interesting. We recruit them all in one group and then we sort. Exactly. Interesting. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. I do want to reemphasize, because this, again, was something that came up in the discussion with the uh, Fatherhood Research and Practice Network, we did do the inter-rater reliability on the observers, and that was really an important step because we could see some places where there was disagreement and what they had just noted. And getting at the heart of why that was happening uh, became important, and it was something that we were able to deal with within the context of training. Could you use the same person to be a facilitator in one group and then an observer for someone else? In other words, to flip the role in with different group of clients? Yes, yes, and I think that is very efficient. And it's important because uh, there may be organizations trying to implement a program that won't have um, tremendous resources. Right. So therefore, having the person be able to play both roles becomes important. So they and they also understand what it is that the facilitator right. is expected to right. do. Great. Well I I think um we're we're almost at time. Um I wanna thank our panel. I think uh you've been fabulous and uh sort of a novel pairing of different ideas, but we've but there's been quite a bit of overlap actually across all three presentations and some conceptual levels. And I want to thank the audience for uh, registering and joining. Everything will be posted on our website. And in another few months, probably uh, in another three months, we'll be bringing you another webinar through FRPN. Um, And uh, thank you very much for uh, participating. And we'll see you next time again. Thank you. Thank you.